I'm really pleased to be here and I see myself as being able to represent the voice of many educators, not just in the school division where I work, but across the country, who I believe are really engaging in the tough, hard work of figuring out how we teach young people in contemporary times for a future that is still unfolding. I'd love to start by just thanking that I have two of those educators with me today, Paula White and Becky Fisher, who are here with me and are rock stars in their own right in terms of influence across the nation. But I want to start with something else, and that is that I also have another colleague in Albemarle County who is a far more famous TED Talker than I will ever be, and that is a person by the name of John Hunter. John is a colleague of mine. He was a TED Talk in 2011, and one of the things that he started out by talking about was a table that's in my office, and that's this table right here. But I have to tell you, the story that John told is actually my story of my grandfather. I used to have great opportunities to sit with my grandfather on his back porch in the low country of South Carolina. We were surrounded when I was a child by sugar sand fields, uh, Black River swamps, and Highway 78 that ran from Augusta, Georgia to Charleston, South Carolina. I will tell you that despite my grandfather's eighth grade education, he taught me that life is full of grand challenges. And a few of the ones that he got me started on as a small child was one, uh, learning how to make change in my head for his customers that would come to buy fresh eggs. Another one of the grand challenges that he put in front of me was understanding the value of the occasional diamondback rattler who would wander through his backyard. <laughs> and a third was really being able to make sense of the science of pollination in his vegetable, vegetable gardens and his zinnia patches. I have to tell you, when I sit at this table in my office today, I remember the real wisdom of my grandfather. But I'll tell you something else about my grandfather. He was born in, 19, in 1889 into a rural Carolina America in which he was surrounded by horse-drawn wagons and daguerreotype images. I like to imagine him there and the life that he led before wireless communication technologies and electricity permeated his life. What I do know is that at the same time there were scientists, engineers, and builders who were exiting the 19th century facing grand challenges at the same time that my grandfather was coming of age. Now I'd like for you to look at this next image and think for a moment what you see here. In 1962, John F. Kennedy issued a grand challenge to the newly minted NASA. And he said something like this, whether it takes one engineer or 10 engineers or 1,000 engineers, we're going to have Americans walking on the moon by the end of this decade in the 1960s. An amazing grand challenge. But he didn't just issue it to NASA, he also issued it to the American people because he said, we're all in this together, and we have to own this together as an investment. So he saw the power of everyone in America as being critical to meeting that grand challenge. So I think about that in regards to my grandfather. And I have to tell you that when he died in 1983, and I had a chance to go through his personal effects, I found this image. I can imagine my grandfather crouched on his knees, in his living room with a Polaroid camera in hand, as close as he could get to a tiny black and white screen, capturing in awe Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in 1969, our first Americans on the moon. And so I think about that and the importance of that in the world that we live in today. Now, it was a grand challenge, but I also think that we have many grand challenges in front of us. So one of the things that I want to think about is that my grandfather understood something that I think is really important for us as educators. He understood that tomorrow is today. He routinely anticipated tomorrows in his daily life. 
whether it was the weather that was going to affect his crops or some new invention or discovery that was going to affect his world. And so he was constantly thinking about how the tomorrows really are our todays. I will tell you that there's also an image up here. Uh, the other part of my life that uh, some people know is that I thought that I was going to start out perhaps uh, chasing snakes around the Everglades when I was in college, but I ended up teaching. I was called to teaching. It's been one of the most important things, probably the most important decision I've made in my life. But the other thing that I understand about my grandfather is that his Polaroid camera is today my iPhone, and that my iPhone is also something else that's even more important. This is a computing device that is more powerful than the computers that the NASA engineers used to help our Apollo missions navigate to the moon. Think about that, an incredibly important invention. So what do we do with tomorrow is today? Well, here's the relevancy to where we are today as educators. And I take a lesson from a friend of mine who is actually a, a retired astronaut who teaches in engineering at the University of Virginia, Kathy Thornton. And I had a chance to hear Kathy recently, and she explains so clearly to a number of us that were in the audience why NASA has gotten out of the business of the space shuttle program. And what she said was something that was really important. And that is that the grand challenge that NASA took on back in the 1960s to put Americans on the moon has been lost a little bit as we developed the low orbit missions of the space shuttle program that have become very commercial in nature. And one of the points that she made is that if we can't get out of that business, that we are likely not going to be able to get back to the main mission of deep exploration of space. So NASA's taken on a different grand challenge and I believe that we educators need to as well. I believe that we are caught as educators in a 20th century version of the space shuttle program where standardized testing, where test prep curriculum keep our educators in a low orbit and that we can't tinker with a low orbit and be able to help ourselves get out into space and do the deep exploration of learning that we need to do for the children we're serving today. So what I want to say is that I believe that our grand challenge is that we've got to figure out how to educate all children that are in our schools today as if they are the future design teams and engineers of NASA for tomorrow. So I'd like to talk about what that might look like. And I'm using verbs here as frames. Design, engineer, build. In these two photographs, and by the way, most of the images that you will see have been captured by my iPhone, that what I want to share with you are a couple of examples of how I believe that we've got to get out of that low orbit. And we've got to take on a different kind of design challenge. On one side, you see a group of second graders who are learning a pretty, pretty significant calculus concept that's relevant to engineering. And that is they're figuring out what it means to have a bending moment. Because what they're exploring is how to build a bridge using Unifix cubes across two tables and to use chairs as spans. And they're working and playing with those spans. Again, that's not something you'll see tested on a multiple choice test, but it's a pretty amazing concept that these children are discovering intuitively. On the other side, you see a young man who was issued a grand challenge in his class by a teacher who literally said, I'd like for you guys to figure out how you can navigate in a dark room without holding a flashlight in your hands. And so he's invented this contraption that he's wearing on his head that involves circuitry. So that's the kind of work that I believe that our children need to be doing. I also believe that we're in a place where we're seeing a real shift from what I call a Gutenberg model of learning Gutenberg meaning that what we did in the Gutenberg era was we wrote it, we printed it, we expected people to read it and to recall it. But we're now at a turning point in what I call the post-Gutenberg learning model 
where our kids are out there all the time searching, connecting, communicating, and making. And yet what we do in schools doesn't necessarily match that kind of a learning model. And I believe that we've got to harness the natural power of children, as humans have always, to learn in ways where they are able to create and connect and communicate and make versus to be consumers. So what I'd love to do is to show you what I consider to be a test bed for learning, a very explicit mission for our teachers to figure out how learning can be different for kids, not something that I would want them to do subversively, trying to get around the forces of Coverly and, and uh, Taylor, who were what I call the cult of efficiency thinkers of the 20th century that really invented the factory floors and the factory schools, but to create a different kind of environment that's open and informal and facilitated by teachers so that kids are meeting that grand challenge. This is called a coder dojo, and I'll give you some advice. If you don't know what a coder dojo is after you watch this short video, I would encourage you to Google it. Children searching, connecting, communicating, and making multi-age, as a team, learning with and from teachers. A different paradigm, a different kind of test bed for learning. I also believe that we live in a world where our kids are surrounded all the time by the capability to mass customize, localize, and globalize learning experiences. That we have less need of mass standardization in our world than we've ever had. In fact, when our world peace gamers, who work with John Hunter, went to the Pentagon and spent a day with policymakers. What the policymakers did was they reinforced these children and they said, we want you to understand that the work you're doing is absolutely the right work that children all over America should be doing because there are no standard problems with standard solutions in today's world. No standard problems with standard solutions in today's world. So we believe that our children need to be focused on how they bring together diverse content, diverse teams, and figure out how we can make that learning personal for them, how we can give them choices, and how they can be people who create, that they see themselves as problem solvers, not problem makers, and that they see themselves as producers, not consumers. And that who we are as educators gets measured by the opportunities and choices that children have when they turn age 30 that begin with our teaching the moment they walk into our learning spaces. So I want to share with you one of our test beds, again, for experimentation, that is our Mesa Academy, Albemarle High School. And thank you, Loudoun County, for having helped us form this as a concept. And this is a group of students who've been challenged to create musical instruments that play on pitch. So I want to share with you their work. One, two, one, two, three, four.
So there they are. Not STEM, but STEAM. Arts plus science, technology, engineering, and math. I also believe that we need to be able to think about very clearly how we make learning not just something that is engaging for our young people today, our contemporary learners, but also something that provides them with the opportunities to integrate, but also to have access. And we know that's one of the greatest challenges that we have, is being able to provide access to our young people. So one of the things that I believe that we all have to be after is how is it that we really look out there met and take the power of everyone, our business companies, our schools, our people in our communities, and figure out how our children, no child will be penalized because they lack access to the tools they need to be successful learners. I also believe that we need to think about looking at learning differently. That in our grand challenge, that we can't see learning as we saw it in the 20th century with people that look like me. That we've got to look at learning very differently. And I believe that we should go back to and perhaps use D.W. Menig's model of looking at learning scenes through multiple lenses. Because learnings are about habitats, about problems, about artifacts, about place, about history, about systems. And one of the things that we know there are a thousand lenses that we can put on. Every time that we increase our capacity to see, we also increase our, our capability to adapt so that we make each day a reflection of tomorrow. One of the things that I think we have to do is to really think about how do we not just flip classrooms in the way we're talking about them today, but how do we flip the whole concept of learning in a way that's reflective of a kind of world that looks very different than the world that we're in right now. So I would ask you to imagine with me John F. Kennedy's work, my grandfather's work, and to think about how is it that we really take on and meet that grand challenge. How is it that we bring our young people together? How do we have maker spaces everywhere? In our schools, outside our schools, virtually, and in every way possible, creating spaces where kids actually create, not just consume. And then, let's look at what we want. I want to see children who have had curiosity, interest, passion, and joy in their lives. And if there's any one thing that we do, I think it's if we can leave our young people with a sense of joy in their learning, that we have done something that perhaps no educators have done before. So I'd like to be able to share with you what I believe it would look like if we meet our grand challenge. <laughs>